Good morning, everybody. It's another uh, Sunday morning, and uh, down here before the family gets up, going to do a flea market find segment. Um, first thing I want to mention is that I uh, repositioned a light over the bench here where I, I'm doing the flea market segments for now. This isn't going to be where the bench is going to stay. But, um, so, that, pardon the glare that's above my head, but uh, once I reposition the camera to show the uh, items, it'll uh, it'll be a big improvement, I think as far as the uh, video quality. Uh, okay, so I want to talk about uh, this stuff that I picked up here. Um, I actually, in the past month, I've been to, I've, I've acquired a few items here and there, but I've been to three sales. Uh, the first of which was a Craigslist listing um, down in Connecticut, and the second one was a uh, an estate clean out type of thing, uh, just the machine shop, not the entire estate, basement machine shop. And the third one was just this past Friday, there was a yard sale that came up listed on Craigslist, but it mentioned a lathe, um, a milling machine, and some other items. So I figured, well, there might be some tooling. So I got in contact with the person who listed the ad, it turned out to be his daughter put me in contact through cell phone with the guy, uh, talked to him, explained my situation, what I was looking for. He said, yeah, you know, probably have some of the things that I'm looking for. Asked him, I said, you know, I'm going to be in the area today. Um, it's about 40 minutes from here normally, but I was only going to be about like 15 minutes from his house. So uh, he was gracious enough to allow me to come over, even though he warned me. He said, you know, we're setting up. He said, you know, this stuff buried. And I said, well, that, that's fine. You know, the whole thing is I wanted to get in there first. Come Saturday morning, even if I woke up early Saturday morning and drove that 45 minutes, by the time I'm out there, any real steals, going to be gone. So, uh, worked out great. Ended up buying a bunch of stuff. There was a couple of items that I wasn't able to get because I uh, actually ran out of money. And um, what ended up happening there was uh, he had said that uh, those, uh, well, there's a story to that, and I'll, I'll include that when I get to that. And that's going to be weeks away for those other two. Well, maybe I'll... We'll see. All right. So, without further ado, let's talk about this sale here. This sale here, don't have a lot to show you. But I want to talk about this guy. This guy was a character. Young man. I call him a young man. If I had to estimate, I'd say maybe as young as early 20s. But probably not any older than... 30. I'd put him somewhere in that time frame, I'd say. So he lists this uh, thing on Craigslist. Originally, initially, he listed it with no pictures. And he um, basically said that he's cleaning out this old barn garage setup and that there's like tons. He said there's like six lathes in there and there's tons of tooling and all kinds of stuff. And the story he gave was that he had bought the property years ago um, from someone that he knew and that now a family member was buying the property back and he needed to clean it out and liquidate it. So this was probably an hour away in Connecticut, but I happened to be taking that day off to take my sons with me to the uh, New England Air Museum. Uh, which, if you are anywhere in central Connecticut and you've never been, it's definitely worth the trip. Nice little air museum. A lot of old uh, World War II stuff there, and uh, there's jets, there's all kinds of cool stuff there. Kids love it. And they've got several exhibits that uh, the kids are allowed to uh, climb in and, you know, sit in the seats and all that. Alright, so, since I was going down there for that, I called this guy and I said, you know, any possibility I could meet you uh, that day? And uh, he agreed to meet me, so uh, I ended up stopping off down there and finding out that uh, this is a uh, an abandoned, empty farmhouse situation. It had a dumpster, roll-off dumpster in the front, so they were clearly clearing the, cleaning the house out. It looked like the house had not been lived in in quite a while. Either that or whoever was living there was not taking care of it. And then in the back there was a detached garage with a good sized workshop attached to it that was pretty rough shape. It was an old, old building. 
nowhere near airtight, nowhere near mouse tight, nowhere near, you know, anything. Not been heated in quite a while, and apparently this guy was a hoarder back in the day, and then at some point he stopped doing that and stopped doing anything and stopped heating the garage. So everything in there was rusty. Um, the lathes, he must have been, he must have fancied himself some sort of collector and went around this, you know, the, the tri-state area haul an old lathe out because he had some really early lathes in there. But a lot of the money in those lathes, unfortunately, is in the cast legs. So I meet this guy. He drives up in a big Duali Chevy pickup truck diesel. So it's like, almost like mine, only a Duali. So I, I you know, figure, oh, I'll break the ice. I said, oh, hey, nice truck, you know. And I don't know if he thought I was being funny or whatever. I said, let's get the 6.5 or a 6.2 turbo. And he says, yeah, yeah. And he says he just bought it for 600 bucks. All right. <clears throat> Maybe he did. Maybe, you know, the bed was kind of rotted. The rear bumper was all smashed up. Farm truck. Maybe he did buy it for six bills. Maybe it needed some work, and he did some work to it. But he was more on the idea claiming that, you know, you just bought it for that kind of money. That's an entire possibility. But now I seriously doubt that because of the other tall tales this guy spun. I'll tell you. So, <laughs> so we're looking around, and I'm, I'm trying to find some stuff, and I'm asking if he's got any really large Morse taper bits. And he said that there was a box with really big ones that's somewhere this big around, you know? So he's, like, kind of looking for that. And now I'm beginning to wonder whether or not they even existed or whether or not he's not really the person who's in charge of this sale or what's... I'm not sure what's going on there, but there's something stinky about this whole deal. So get this, so he tells me uh, at one point when we're in the sale and I'm looking around and I'm commenting about some of the stuff that I see. I saw an overarm support, arbor support, for a big old milling machine. No milling machine on the premises, but the arm was there. The guy obviously had gotten it from somewhere. It had a tag on it that looked like it was an auction item that he picked up somewhere. And I'm thinking to myself, boy, I know, you know, if you've got a milling machine and you don't have that overarm, um, you know, on eBay, That'll bring some decent money. So, some of the things he told me was that uh, he has three girls working for him listed on eBay. Uh, some of the other things he said was, oh, this is the best one. He said he's got a standing offer that a guy came down, looked at it last night, looked at the entire contents of the place, and offered him ten grand for it. Ten G's. I wish I had taken a picture of this stuff because, hey, I'm not an expert. I know there's not 10 grand sitting there. Uh, I saw an old oil can, commented about the old oil can, you know, just trying to make conversation again. And again, every time I tried to make conversation casually, this guy turned it into a tall tale. So he says to me, he says, oh, yeah, he says there was some uh, gallon oil cans in here, Vidal oil. So I already sold one on eBay for over $700. Over $700, he said. Hey, I'm not an oil can expert, but I watch American Pickers. I know that some of these oil cans can be rare and valuable. Saw an American Eagle oil can, the, the hand pump oil can, the, the, the uh, V-Doll oil can, V-E-E-D-O-L, if you want to Google it, um, you know, that, that actually motor oil came in. Um, then I saw he had a bunch of oilers. And he had some of the American Eagle pump oilers, which I don't know if you've ever seen those, but those are like a really nice oiler from back in the day, and they're actually sought today, and they still, they still, you know, if they're in good shape, they can bring decent money. He had a couple of those right there, and uh, he said that he got 75 bucks for one on eBay. So when he said that, I didn't even bother making an offer on those oilers, you know. So finally... Uh, ended up uh, realizing he's not going to find this big box of Morse tapers. I had found one box of drill bits, which is going to be the first item up for today. And uh, then I ended up buying a box, uh, box number two. I didn't cut super deals on it because, of course, he's, he's running stories the whole time, telling me he wants, you know, I think, well, I can get this much for that and this much for that. Meanwhile, I'm still wondering why the hell he's turning down a ten grand offer for what's in there. Ten grand and done, you know. And he talked about how I, I said to him, "This is, what, <laughs> this is well, 
why not take that offer? He said, you know, you don't have to do anything. Because he's talking about how these guys said he'd come out and one day they'd unload it. And I said, you know, there's a lot of stuff in here. And then he starts telling me about, I said, oh, I can have this whole place cleaned out in one day. Well, so then what ends up happening is I buy my couple of items. And then he realizes that, A, I'm not a sucker. I'm not going to well, pay him three times what it's really worth. Uh, I think he just realized that I was a educated consumer, so uh, educated buyer. So I, he kind of like uh, started to lose interest in the whole thing. He talked about that he had a bunch of carbide bits that were almost brand new, but he had brought those back to the house. And he had already admitted to me that he lived right up the street, that supposedly this property abutted his property. So I'm like, well, you want to take a ride up there and get those? Because I'm not seeing anything else that I even want. It's all covered with rust, it's junk. It's old and not in a good way. And I'm beginning to doubt those even exist. And I'll tell you why. Because I ended up um, calling him that afternoon on my way back from the Air Museum to see whether or not he had a chance to either find the Morse taper bits or bring those carbide bits down so that I could take a look at those. And he was very abrupt with me on the phone and told me, oh, I had a guy come down and he bought the whole load. It's everything, really? Yeah. He claims that after I left, within an hour and a half, another guy came and bought the whole shebang. And then he had another crazy number on it, like $12,000 or some shit. Ooh, excuse my language. I'll bleep that out. So, anyways, <laughs> just for the heck of it I'm curious about this oil can I want to find the sold auction on eBay for this can I can't find any that are anywhere near where this guy's town was so then I start looking at live auctions and what do I find newly listed so like the day after he told me oh uh, yeah yeah well I find the eBay seller it's a woman's name, so this is probably one of the women he's talking about. Okay, Now, I don't know whether or not he's selling the stuff to her and she's turning around and listing it, or what's going on there. But lo and behold, there's the oil can with an opening, like starting bid of like 10 bucks or something like that. It sat there and did like $7. You know what? The final selling was way under 100 bucks was what it ended up selling for in the end because I watched it over the next several days. But it proved to me a couple of things. It proved to me, A, he hadn't sold one on eBay. B, he didn't get $700 for it. C, he didn't sell everything lock, stock, and barrel for that kind of big money. Because if he did sell it all, he sold it to this person who's now listing on eBay. But suspiciously, the town was the same town. So he either sold it to somebody in town who's an eBayer, or he does have somebody who's helping him list this stuff on eBay. So now I just kind of got to grin because I'm seeing lots that he's putting up now, lots of you know straight reamers that I was passing on because he wanted too much money for and things like that. Now he's got them all listed up on there, he's got opening bids, or he's, he's, if he's getting bids at all, he's getting a lot less money than, you know, in some cases than what I was going to offer him because I was there. Keeping in mind also he should be discounting anyways because cash in hand is better than going through the trouble listing on eBay. Shipping on uh, shipping to the to the packing and shipping. Worrying about damage. Oh, that's what insurance is for. That's what he said to me. That's what insurance is for. It was almost like once he has cash in hand, this guy doesn't care what happens to that thing. You know what? I ship something to somebody. I make sure it's packed so it gets there. Because it's not just about the money. It's about putting good quality, usable things back to you, uh, you know, back in service instead of to the scrapyard. And, yeah, I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's, it's, the money doesn't matter. Damn right, I'm going to try and maximize my dollar. I'm going to try and get the most I can out of it. But, if that person's willing to pay me that kind of money for the thing, I certainly am going to care about whether or not it gets to it in one piece, in usable condition. So, So that guy was a real... 
a complete contrast to the guy who I met um, Friday at the yard sale. Uh, and you know, I'll talk about him when I when I get to that series. But it's interesting to me. This is becoming more of an exercise with socializing with people than it is a you know purely tool acquiring thing. Uh, all right, so let me reposition the camera, and we'll look at the two boxes of junk I bought. All right, so here's the first item I bought, and it's a box of more taper drill bits. And like that's the largest one that's in there. And you can see the kind of rust that I was dealing with there at this place. And then there's actually some that are in pretty decent shape. Some of these have a you know a black oxide coating, been resharpened, but that'll clean up easy enough. Some of them are a little more rusty. Here's one that's unfortunately the shank's pretty rusty on this one because this is actually kind of a neat one because it's so long you know, so that's basically this one it's in excellent shape but it's been ground to almost a zero degree rake angle so that was probably that was probably something that uh, somebody ground to cut uh, to drill through really soft material like uh, brass or copper or something like that. There's some decent ones in here. Um, there we go. Again, nice drill, but the shank's pretty rusty. Hopefully that'll clean up enough so that I can use it. So you wanted 50 bucks for this box of rusty old drills, and I was like thinking more like 20. And in the end, the best I do, this actually had a few less in it, and I, I found a couple laying around here, and I tossed in a couple more, and I said, 30's the top I'll do on that. So he wasn't thrilled about it, but he took the 30. I guess he figured he wanted at least for his time and trouble of coming down and meeting me from up the street. He wanted to, uh, you know get something out of it so gave him the 30 for that and just out of curiosity do a quick count thirty one drills so as luck would have it might as well just probably consider at least one of those as junk a buck a piece yeah you know what I've bought bigger lots of Morse taper drills for that. But now I'm sounding like I'm complaining. A buck a piece? That's really not that bad. Alright, so this next box we haggled on and I finally ended up spotting a few Morse taper drill bits I had missed initially and uh, adding them to the box so that we could finally agree on the 40 bucks. Yep, more taps. This, I don't know how this managed to survive, but it ended up being the nicest drill bit in the place. And actually, you know what, now that I think of it, I think this was actually in with something else and I just threw it on top. The, yeah, these were the these were the Morse taper drill bits that I ended up finding laying around. Right here. Because this was all caps in here, so these Morse tapers can go with the other ones. And this one's actually got a sleeve on it, a good size sleeve on it. Which interestingly enough, this 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 sleeve, this is a Morse taper sleeve, but it's actually got a uh, it's got a threaded back to it for like a draw bar. And then oh, look at that, there's another one. And the beauty of that is now that's going to be pristine in there because uh, you know what? Maybe that this might not have this might have been with this one from another sale because these all look more these look like the, the ones I threw in there I don't remember anything really nice going in this box to add to it mainly th thing I looked at was the, the taps oh, look at that I said I got some big taps in here and I got so many taps now I didn't really 
I wasn't even really that excited about paying the 40 bucks for this, believe it or not. Even though there were some taps in here that if you had to buy the tap. Look at this monster. This tap. And it's still usable. Got little spots of surface rust here and there, but it's not it's not so bad you couldn't use it. Of course there's rust right where the size is on that one. You can't read what this is. That tap though is probably the largest one I own now. It's fine thread, but it's big. There's one that survived in good condition. There's a decent size one there. This is one and an eighth. So if this is one and an eighth, that's one and an eighth. This must be close to one and a half or something like that. Big tap. There's another big one. Alright, here's one. Looks like it might be just about the same size. No, that's finer thread. It's a really fine thread there. This one. Got some cobwebs on it, but it is in excellent shape. NF, so fine thread. 12. 1 and 3 eighths dash 12. So, not 1 and a half. 1 and 3 eighths 12 tap. I mean, what's that going to run in you? Probably some serious cash, right? Um, so, I mean, mostly larger taps in here. There's this little straight ream that somehow got lost in the shuffle. But what closed the deal for me was I spotted this tap in there. And I took one look at it and I said, son of a gun, if that doesn't look like a tap for a, uh, what's the thread I'm trying to think of? Atlas thread? No. But tell me that doesn't look like a lead screw, right? So what I was thinking was that this might be a tap for a uh, for making the nut that runs on a lead screw, and it looked just looks so specialized. I thought, well, this could be a sleeper. This could be something I may never use, but it could be something that somebody on eBay might pay big bucks for. So this looks like it's a number. Well, it's kind of hard to see. Well, it's got some strange numbers on it, size-wise. 1.0623 P. 3 by 4. Looks like it looks like a multiplication sign. I'm saying I'm thinking three quarter inch. B dot C dot high speed steel. B C something coarse. Can't find a maker's name on it. But that looks like a very interesting tap to me. Oh, here's another big one here. Mice were in here. You can see the, uh, and they love ripping out that insulation out of the walls and making their nests in it. Doesn't bother them. They don't itch when they're getting that stuff. Look at this. What's this? Tap extension? Hmm. Another one. Little tap extensions. I don't have any of those. Do now. That's a big sucker. What we got here? That's an inch and a half. All right, so that's the big one. So that's well, without the, with the tape on it, it's kind of hard to tell. But that might be an inch and a half fine thread. So that's probably my largest tap now, an inch and a half. I don't even think I have a tap wrench large enough to turn that. So let's see. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm done. That's it. That's it with this guy. Never going back and seeing him again. I'm going to continue to watch the auctions, though, just for giggles. Oh, a lot of change gears laying around. He's talking about selling all those lathes, right? And then I see he lists on eBay, or this woman, lists like a whole lot of change gears. So, um, then they almost immediately get a hundred dollar. It was ninety nine dollar ninety nine cent or whatever because he wants to probably stay underneath that, uh, if it doesn't bring any more money, he wants to stay underneath that limit uh, as far as fee structure goes, probably. You almost immediately get an opening bid of ninety nine ninety nine, and then that's all they end up selling for. And then I see another lot. Now, it's possible he's got that many change gears, and he's relisting. 
I mean, he's listing more and more sets, but it's also possible he's relisting it. So the question is, why would you relist it as a new auction if you just sold it for $100? And why when he just takes a picture of it and he doesn't even tell you what's in there for gears, does somebody pop a hundred bucks on it right away? Hmm. Does anybody know what shill bidding is? Well, anyways, I was just thinking, sold all those change, if he really did sell those change gears, he's selling all those change gears off, all those lathes are sitting there that he supposedly wants to sell. If you've got a lathe you want to sell and you've got change gears for it, you better keep a bunch of lathes. There wasn't a lathe in there with a quick change gearbox. They were all early, early, early machines. So if somebody actually wanted to set up one of those lathes and use it, now they're going to have to go and try and find all those change gears. So these three items right here actually, uh, sorry, these four, five items right here, I actually had these in the very bottom drawer of my big mechanics toolbox tucked in the back. These are actually items that were uh, going to be thrown out at that estate that I bought the Hendy lathe and the Atlas lathe from. Um, and I had totally forgotten they were in there. And I now want to transfer these to be stored with the other measuring instruments in my machinist toolboxes. So this would actually be a, uh, saved from the scrapper. So. Um, I'm not sure how I'm going to title that, but title this entire video segment. But I don't think I ever end up showing this stuff. So this is a uh, what's left of the case for got some finish, uh, some surface rust on it here. But this is kind of a funky micrometer. And this is something I definitely think I'm just going to see whether or not anybody will give me anything for on eBay. But this has got basically like this rough adjustment here where you just loosen this thumb wheel, tighten this down and then it's still got the, the more standard micrometer deal here but interestingly enough oh I see that's unscrewing, okay so what's intriguing to me is I'm wondering what this originally this sat in here and then there was probably a standard that went there maybe this little thing here is just so probably so you can get your finger in there to pull this out. I don't know. I was wondering what these three grooves were for. So I don't know what's missing from this set. So oddly enough, this is actually marked like three and four. So I'm assuming that's like three inches, four inches. But there's no, yeah, two, one, two, three, four. But there's no line anywhere on this to line this up. I was like, what, are you supposed to just put it here and go, yeah, that's about three inches? And the fact that it's got this case makes me think that this is not a shop-made item. The micrometer, it says 200P-1. And the maker, can't find any markings on it. Just couldn't bring myself to let them throw it out. It was offered to me for free. Eh, this is a Starrett Satin Chrome Micrometer, 12 big features at no extra cost. This is a model 214C, 1 inch to 2 inch. And that's not what this is, okay, because this is not a Satin Chrome. This is a 1 inch to 2 inch, number 436. So this is an older one, got some surface rust there on the thimble, but it's free, and it's a Starrett, and it doesn't have carbide tip anvil, uh, anvils on it, so again, not something, not something I'll probably end up keeping, the uh, box is for a newer one, satin chrome finish, 10 thousandths hardened ground screw with lock nut. Oh, this does say without ratchet stop. High micro finish on anvil and spindle. Huh. This is the Cle no, Central Tool Company of Cranston, Rhode Island. For half a century, makers of fine precision tools. I wonder if they're still in business. But we got this nice big Central Tool Company 5 to 6 inch micrometer. This is, feels like it's in pretty good shape has a 
either this click stop is broken or it's not a click stop and it's just a, like a friction type deal. It's got the lock. It's got the, it looks like carbide tipped. Right, so that's a nice little larger micrometer. A little uh, micrometer instructions and a special little tiny wrench. Wow, look at that sucker. Uh, it clearly shows that that's for apparently making some kind of an adjustment on the barrel maybe. Yeah, looks like looks like you gotta un unthread this from here and then uh, that must be the wrench that goes in there to make adjustment. It's not a sterret but that was a good find for free. This is a box that contains ah, a bevel gauge uh, this is a nice, uh, this is a Helios, the first vernier, uh, I'm sorry, the first dial caliper that I ever owned was a Helios, and uh, it's actually a pretty well-made tool, and I think these are made in Germany, maybe? Yeah, this is made in Germany. So this is actually, it's been engraved with the former owner's name, the box also. So this clearly was something that he treasured. Uh, it's got the you know the bevel. Uh, probably originally this may or may not have come with some additional attachments. One of the things I think is kind of neat is it's got this little loop. So if we take that knob off and we remove that screw, we can screw this on. And what that does is that puts this little magnifier right in the perfect position to read the uh, degrees. So that that's kind of neat, I thought. That's a nice little, uh, that's a nice little bevel gauge. But I don't know if I'm gonna keep that, because that's a, let's see, the box is for a, uh, well, actually, this is interesting. This says on the box, Fowler Precision Tools Protractor VP6. So the box is for a Fowler protractor, but it's a Helios. This also says Inox on it. I N O X. Does anybody know what that means? I N O X. It's not stamped on by the owner. This is definitely from the, from the manufacturer. I N O X. And then we got this. Here's a Helios um, radius gauge set. Now I've got to stare at one of these somewhere. So yeah, from the... Oh, I forgot about the rude guy at the tractor show. But he was he was abrasive in a different way. And he was just kind of hardened from years of dealing with cheap skates like me. So I, anyway, oh, he was uh, politically incorrect probably just due to upbringing and age. But uh, what I like about this is this has got this little rod right here. So you can uh, clamp, clamp onto the uh, radius gauges. Boy, I'm thinking now that at some point along the way, I've come across one of these rods that clamps onto something like this and had no idea what it was for, and now believe that it was from one of these sets. Clamps at an angle. You take this, put that like that. This must be for the really small ones, maybe. They probably figure for the bigger ones, you can just, you know, hold on to them with your fingers. Let's take one of these small ones. Ah, oh, yeah, the small one's got this little notch. Oh, that's the idiot. Never mind. All right, I must have tightened this too far. There we go. And we tighten this down like that, and there you go. There's your your handle for your radius gauge. I bet you this is missing in my Starrett set. Funny thing is, I don't remember seeing a spot for one of these holders in the Starrett set. I just remember thinking to myself, hey, at least the set's complete. Well, turns out maybe it wasn't. Oh, well, there it is right there. There's the little loop. It's actually broken, but that's what was, that's why that was there. Oh, well. All right, so this next item is something that I wanted because I'm getting close to, you know, finishing the Vernon lathe, and I'm, 
I wanted a precision machinist level to level the lathe. And ideally what I wanted was I wanted a, a Starrett 199. Now the Starrett 199s, they come up on eBay regularly and they trade. Like right now, the lowest price one I've seen, the bidding isn't done on it yet. It's at $177 and change. Um, and it's in the wooden case. And, you know, it wouldn't be unusual for that to, to bring two... 225 somewhere around there by the time the auction's over or if somebody gets a deal they might just settle it right there at the 177. The point is these precision levels are expensive and there's basically there's the master level which is the 199. I mean I'm sure I'm missing other series in that but for the most part you've got those and then you've got the other series which is the 98 series so you've got like the 98 6, 98 8, 98 12 I think or how the increments go. And that's a pretty popular level. And the 9812 tends to typically bring around 75 to 100 bucks if it's got like, especially if it's an earlier one with a nice wooden case. So uh, you see those all the time. And then I saw a listing on Craigslist pop up and it said, uh, the guy had a, uh, he was claiming he had, there was no picture, he was claiming he had an 18 inch Starrett machinist level. Well, here's the thing. I had never heard of a 98-18 level. So my first thought was, he's got one of these old, he's got one of these. This is a Starrett. <laughs> And I think I had already figured that this one looks like it may have been cut down at some point in its life. But this is a Starrett level, and there's a 24-inch version of, of these right now on Craigslist that they want big money for. Um, so I thought maybe that's what this guy had, was something like that. But he was close by, so... Um, to one of the places I had happened to be doing some work, so... I made uh, arrangements to meet him at his work. He had the level with him and uh, drove out and uh, took a look. And much to my surprise, oh, and the other thing too was that the listing was a few days old. Uh, might have even been over a week old at that point. But what I had noticed that he had misspelled Starrett, which is a common, it's a common error people make. Um, because Starrett has two R's and two T's, and that just seems like too many consonants. So what ends up happening is people invariably like to drop one of the R's. Um, so what happens is Craigslist search engine is very unforgiving with misspellings. So uh, you end up having to search for several different things if you want to catch everything. So this is what I ended up getting from him. So this looks just like a 98 series level. The interesting thing about it, this is a really early one, by the looks of it. The interesting thing about this is um, there are, I can't find any markings on it whatsoever other than what somebody engraved in here. Bell 14, 55194E. Looks like there might have been something there. Looks like there might have been a sticker there that was removed. Probably a calibration sticker. Um, the vial is also engraved. Again, not with anything that would have to do with identifying it. And the only other thing we have is that it says right here, the L.S. Sterrett Company, Athol Mass, USA. So we got the, the, the main bubble here, and then we've got a cross bubble here, and then we've got a vertical bubble here. So it's kind of cool. So the first thing I wondered was, is it 18 inch? Well, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, it's an 18. So I had to go and stare at its website to find it, and it turns out this is a 98-18. Um, here's the original box that's in bad shape, but unfortunately, somebody had taped this end 
at some point, I think, and somebody pulled the tape off, it ripped the label off. So right here is where that, that label would have been with the part number on it. So uh, this says not in system, which tells me this was in a company where they didn't inventory it for some reason. Uh, somebody wrote over here, good condition, dated 2005. So back in 2005, they considered this to be in good condition. I don't know where it's been spending most of its time now. I don't see any major, you know, it's got some surface scratches on it, but no major dings or gouges. And for my purposes here, leveling my old lathes, that's going to be a really nice thing to have. So he wanted a hundred bucks or he was interested in trades. Turns out what he traded for was willing to trade for. I didn't have anything up. He was a sportsman and he was into bow hunting. I didn't have anything that was going to help him out there. So as far as trades go, that was pretty much out of the picture. So we came down to cash and I tried to get it for 70 bucks and he stood firm at 100 and then finally I got him to just acquiesce to a $10 drop and I bought this for 90 bucks. Unless I come across an estate sale that has a 199 in the box that I get a really good deal on, this is going to be the lathe for my lifetime. So we're going to put that away because we're not ready to start messing with, messing with leveling the vernon just yet.